Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Certainly want to reiterate Samson's greeting and appreciate his uh, comments of welcome. And uh, it is certainly a glorious, uh, glorious day. So we're continuing in our series on taking a closer look at not just Jesus' teachings, but the way in which, the ways in which Jesus chose to get those messages across. So what I'd like everybody to do just now, this is not a Jesus method, this is a gym method, but I would like you to, to close your eyes for about 20 or 30 seconds, and I'd like you to briefly meditate on those top three or four scenes of Jesus' life that come to your mind. So think about Jesus and what kind of snapshots and pictures might you get from that. Perhaps you see Jesus in a manger or Jesus and his apostles breaking bread in the upper room. The crucifixion scene, perhaps. Jesus beside an empty tomb talking to Mary. Or Jesus ascending into heaven. And while you're considering this, what about Jesus bent over on his knees, assuming the position of a lowly servant to wash the dirty, stinking feet of his apostles? Okay. You can come back. <laughs> Well, our primary text for today is John chapter 13. I'd encourage you to turn to that. So we're going to take a look at what is a very popular, famous, and perhaps one of the most amazing uh, passages of Scripture in the whole story of Jesus, and that is Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Let's read the text, and then we'll unpack it and consider a few things from this passage. Well, it was just before Passover festival. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, the son of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then the Lord, then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done to you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am, now that I your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You should also wash one another's feet. I have set to you an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Well, the practice of feet washing can be found in ancient times, but I don't believe it's anything too popular in our Canadian culture. I guess the closest we get is Canadians tend to want to take their shoes off when they go visit somebody. And, uh, uh, but this idea of foot washing is something that is uh, very uh, ancient. And primarily, a, a host would consider it a courtesy to guests to offer up water so they can either clean the feet themselves or that they can have a servant do that. Well, the reason for this custom, I'm sure you can figure out, is uh, very logical. You know, people walked everywhere. Or they rode animals, which meant the animals were walking on the paths. Most wore sandals or walked in bare feet. Pedestrians generally did not have paved roads like we have today. Rather, they were dusty, muddy, and dirty. And not only would feet be exposed to dust and mud, but the numerous animals on the walkways, combined with lack of sewage systems, would mean feet were stepping into every disgusting thing that you could imagine. And so it's in that context that people would walk into somebody's home. And of course, culturally, uh, foot, foot washing uh, was uh, very popular. In fact, uh, just going back into uh, uh, Greek and Roman culture, uh, with the Greek culture going, going back before Jesus' time, foot washing was a part of their daily life. And it was part of social and religious as well. Going back to the Greek writer Homer, his writings make mention of foot washing as a form of hospitality as well as a religious rite, ritual. It was even a form of blasphemy towards the Greek gods if one were to enter the temple of Aphaia without washing their feet. Foot washing was considered menial work, often performed by slaves, and at that, female slaves. But on the flip side, if a free person willingly washed the feet of another, it was actually considered a great expression of friendship. Also, washing the feet of elderly members at home would be a sign of respect. Well, in the Roman culture, it was... Similar, the Romans tended to borrow many things from the Greek culture. Uh, in the Roman culture, if a person didn't wash their feet for a day, uh, they would be considered uncivilized, and they'd be criticized for it. I came across a reference that uh, uh, it was considered you might be unfortunate to walk a Roman street in the evening after everyone had finished. They were getting ready for bed, and everybody had finished washing their feet, and the dirty water out the windows onto the street. And uh, the, the reference was you wouldn't want to be caught out there uh, because so many people were going through that ritual at the same time. Well, we do see in the Bible as well, there's a, there's a number of examples. I'm just going to touch a few. I mean, we, we, uh, there's, there's the ritual washings uh, going on. But I just want to highlight a few that were specific to feet washing. You may not have noticed these before. You know, you read these... You read these passages of scripture, and, uh, uh, and they, uh, all of a sudden you're like, oh, they're talking about feet washing. Well, I never really paid attention to that before. So how about uh, Abraham, who, who showed hospitality to three strangers, representatives of God, or, and, and Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them. He bowed down to the ground, and he said, if I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. But we see similar with uh, 
Abraham's nephew Lot, you know, he actually entertained angels in the city of, of Sodom. And same thing, he says, uh, come to my home and, and you can wash your feet and you can spend the night. Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac and ended up in the home of Laban. And again, uh, Laban uh, uh, provided water for this servant and his men to wash their feet. So it was a very uh, common greeting. Uh, even in the time of Joseph, uh, you know, there was this with Joseph and his brothers uh, back and forth. And his brothers came and, and the steward of Joseph, the servant of Joseph, uh, gave them water to wash their feet. Well, water, or I mean, washing feet, I just want to summarize that into these different groupings. So foot washing was a form of hospitality, which was self-performed or performed by a servant. Could be a, ri a religious ritual. Uh, there was also references to to masters and slaves. Slaves would be expected to wash the feet of the masters. And some of that would actually be a, uh, uh, it was a sign not just of service, but of submission uh, to them. Uh, husbands and wives, uh, there was an interesting element there that it was, it was more intimate. And it was the wife washing the feet of the husbands. I suggested that to Amy uh, yesterday. And, and at least I just raised the point. I didn't ask, I just raised the point. And, and, and also uh, fathers and children, and Jason, I didn't uh, mention this one, but uh, we'll talk about this one afterwards, uh, that, that uh, uh, it was a sign of respect to the, to the elders when, when, when some other family member. So it's not, so within the context of what we're talking about today, so, so the whole idea of, of foot washing uh, in itself was not, I mean, it was a very, very uh, a sound cultural uh, uh, activity, and the who did the foot washing was not necessarily, it wasn't always fitting into the category of, of as what we find with Jesus and his disciples, this idea that, that when you went to someone's house, it was, it was the most menial task that could be done. Well, by the way, I wanted to mention as well, in, in, Roman, uh, in Roman times, the Ro one of the Roman emperors, and I always get his name, uh, I'm looking at Amy on this one, uh, Qu Quigula? Did I get Caligula? Caligula. Uh, he forced all the members of the Senate to wash his feet as a as a kind of a forced demonstration to them that that he was he was the boss and that was exerting his authority over him a, a obvious abuse of the of that practice. <clears throat> I'm not covering off too many New Testament references, uh, but there are a couple that come to mind. We'll, we'll reference one in a few minutes. But another one is, if you recall, when Jesus actually had his feet anointed, he was, he was in the home of Simon the Pharisee, and he criticized, he rebuked Simon for not providing water for foot washing. He didn't rebuke him for, for uh, Simon not washing Jesus, his feet, but it was a common courtesy even in that time. Okay, so that's a little bit of background on this idea of, of, of foot washing, and if you're taking notes and you're going to go home and kind of uh, work with your, your, your family members on this, you're certainly welcome to do that, but uh, that's not really the context of today. The... Kind of as we come back to chapter 13 in Acts... I want to begin this with actually a reference from Luke. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 24, so we can appreciate the different gospel writers had different accounts of the Last Supper. And, and interesting enough, the, the account uh, that, of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is unique to the Gospel of John. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't cover that off. But they cover other elements. And one of the things that, that Luke covers off is this, which is all about the same time that this was occurring. So I, I want to give this as part of the setup to this. Verse 24, a dispute also rose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. 
Now, as I read this, you go, boy, haven't we heard that story before? Yes, we, do, we have heard that in, in multiple times. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest of you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like one who serves. So interesting, Luke is capturing that component of it, and then John, in this more detailed way, uh, is, is relaying this idea of, of, of greatest and least. But I do want to, just for a moment, give a little bit of background to another time that this argument uh, had occurred. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record an account of an earlier dispute while the group was headed towards Jerusalem. So only months previous, kind of after, the, after the, uh, the, ex the experience on the mountaintop with the, with the, the transfiguration of Jesus, is that they were north of Galilee, they came back through Galilee, and as they're coming back through Galilee, they're at Capernaum. What I'd like to do is uh, identify that... Uh, I'm going to read this. What I did is I've kind of mashed together the, the, the different... Uh, accounts from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because each one has different gems to it. So if you're following in your Bible, you're going to find that I'm jumping around a bit. I, I did color code it uh, for record's sake, and, and but I want us just to read through this. So this is a compilation, if you will, of, of the three gospel accounts of this story. Uh, at that time, an argument started among the disciples as to which one of them would be greatest. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way, they had argued about who would be greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be very last, and the servant of all. The disciples came to Jesus and asked, well, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he took a child in his arms and he said to them, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For it is the one who is least among you who is the greatest. Just to give a little plug for our sermon theme of looking at different uh, teaching techniques of Jesus, I, I couldn't resist one. I, Jamie's not here today, I don't think, to, <laughs> to see this, but... Uh, but I'm actually going to cover off about three or four of them. So they're, they're, I just want to draw this out, is that Jesus did use some interesting techniques here for his teaching. One is a convicting question, a very challenging question he asked them. Uh, you know, he, he, he knew what they were thinking, uh, but, uh, but to get his, his to, to really create this opportunity for teaching, he, he asked that question. We talked about that. Uh, Jamie covered that in a sermon last week about, about asking questions. Uh, interesting enough, I don't know if you caught that, but... Uh, he asked them the question, and then Jesus sat down and said to his apostles. Well, that is actually Jesus taking the rabbinical position for teaching. That was kind of the standard teaching. Jesus, Jesus actually used, a, let's call it a classroom setting. That was the classroom setting that he sat down, and, 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 and they likely sat down there with him. And then the third one, which, was, which I'm sure you caught, was this object lesson where, you know, here's a little child, which interesting enough, you know, when we're talking about, when we're talking about washing feet and a lowly position and the idea of the lowest servant is the one that's doing the washing and, and doing that very humble task, uh, children were even considered, I mean, they were important because they were the next generation, but they really didn't become important until they hit, you know, 12 years of age when they were very little like that, they were considered kind of at the low end of, of everything. I mean, Paul even talks about that. You know, the child, you're a slave for a time. You know, he's talking spiritually. Uh, but I just want to draw your attention that this passage, very similar to uh, in, in the Last Supper, is, 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 is really 
emphasizing this idea, and of course this is where we're going with this lesson, is emphasizing the idea of, of this complete humility and turning yourself completely over. And we'll cover off a few of those points uh, in, a, in a few moments. Well, let's come back to John chapter 13. Jesus is in his final hours. Jesus has spent three years with his apostles, teaching, being an example to them. But his disciples, even in this, with the hours and minutes ticking by, are continuing to struggle with who he is, what he's been teaching them, what he expects of them, and what their role is in this new kingdom, which is to be led by Jesus. I want to point this point in, in verse 3, chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He also knew that he had come from God and was returning to God. They are having this debate about who is the greatest, and right before them is the greatest, most powerful individual that has ever walked on the earth. And Jesus is even making, or John, John the writer is making that statement right here. And Jesus knew it, and he knew he had come from the Father, and he knew where, that he was going back to the Father. You know, we look at this as an example that Jesus gave them. And we might mistakenly think that this is the same thing as a demonstration. It's like walking through Costco and there's a demonstration of some cooking thing or something. This is not a demonstration. The difference between what Jesus did and a demonstration is a demonstration, the demonstrator generally gains nothing from the demonstration. It's the people that are receiving it. And the apostles definitely were receiving a teaching from Jesus about, about becoming lowly and pouring yourself out. But let's look at Jesus just for a minute. There's another takeaway here, I believe, is that a little time later, Jesus tells Peter, do you not know that I could call upon my father for 12 legions of angels? And he just said that he had all power here. So he knew he had the power. He had the escape button. I, I don't know how other to say it. I mean, he even prayed about taking the cup away. He had the ability to, bah, I'm out of here. And at this point in time, as he got up from the meal, he could have gone one way or the other. And think about later in at the end of the passage that we talked about when it said in John chapter 13, verse 17, the very end of this, it said, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Think about that for a minute. The apostles will be blessed if they completely pour out their self-focus and become perfectly humble. They will benefit. God will bless them. Well, if God will bless them, God will also bless Jesus in the hours to come if Jesus truly pours himself out. And so what we have in this passage is Jesus not giving a demonstration, but real life lead, making a point not for them, but Jesus also doing something that he had to do so that he was prepared and so that he got the strength from God to actually take the cup and go through this time of anguish and to go through this dark period. I just want to leave three, uh, just a few takeaways. True Christian living begins with unconditional love. This passage began with... Having loved his own, 
who were with him, who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Complete humility was demonstrating the full extent of his love. It demands ridding ourselves of pride. The pride that we carry, this example, this, this teaching of Jesus is saying that we completely submit, we push ourselves to the side. Well, I told, I told uh, Brandon that I'd get a formula in here that he could get, so here's your formula. The formula, love equals humility. And love is based on selflessness. Acts of humble service glorify God. So that doesn't mean you do acts of service and completely pour out. First of all, you don't do acts of service just for acts of service so you can, can give the appearance of living the Christian life. You are doing the acts of service because you have completely put yourself aside. You've pushed out your selfishness. You've taken on humility as Jesus had. And God will bless us when we act with humility and love. You know, it wasn't very long, a uh, little bit later, and John, uh, you know, John chapter 13 to 17 is giving, is so much rich. It puts us right there with Jesus and with his apostles. And, and, and Jesus prayed, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. So my challenge for you is to consider that prayer and pray that prayer. And pour out yourself, or I should say, you can't pray that prayer fully until you pour out yourself, you put yourself aside, and you treat each other from a position of extreme humility.